we are recording and let me share my screen so where the right so welcome to this core interim meeting the second this year uh, just a reminder uh, this is an official ITF meeting so the note will apply if you're not familiar with this point already please get familiar with them and that said we can move on to the main topic of today it's progress on the dynamic document especially the new parameters and uh, we can also revisit open issues on the github uh, so Bill floor is yours I can navigate the slides for you Okay, thank you, and hello, everybody. Uh, it's uh, good to virtually see you all again. Um, I know we don't have a, a lot of people here, but still, it's it's great to see all of you uh, today. So, yeah, so um, I'm not sure what else is on the agenda today except for DynLink, and I'm not sure how long it's going to take, but but uh, let's, let's get through some of these things that have happened. Um, so currently, the developments are that uh, DynLink was submitted um, um, in January, the, the, the latest version. Uh, that was done after the IETF meeting. Um, and uh, the, the discussions from that uh, led, to, led to version 12. So currently, I just, today I just wanted to tell you what, what changed between version 11 and version 12. Um, and then uh, the ongoing editorial work and also try to get some feedback from all of you for the next changes. Okay, could you go to the next page? Right, so um, the, uh, oh, sorry. I think there's an, uh, there's an artifact there from from uh, uh, the first bullet point. I'm sorry that that shouldn't have been there. But um, there are changes from uh, version, version 11 to version 12, mostly, mostly from, uh, this okay so there are several versions several several issues and and this issue that you see now issue number 25 was closed but um it's it's a it's a slight semantic change um and the, there's the the wording was changed in such a way that uh in version 11 of a died link the p max or the maximum period was uh specified to always be greater than zero and always be greater than p min um and in version 12, we changed it slightly so that uh, the P min and P max can be equal. And the justification for that came came from the Open Mobile Alliance, um, which actually had a company and they had a specific use case where they wanted P min to equal P max so that a client could get a notification uh, exactly every n seconds. So this was uh, an issue that Dave Navarro raised, and then I, I um, asked at the last uh, meeting, and then there were no objections, so, so that went inside. Um, so uh, I wanted to check with you uh, about this, because I'm, I still have uh, certain reservations about just letting it um, be altered this way without giving any explanations. Do you, as a working group, think that this is a good idea just to uh, explain that it can be uh, Pmax can be equals to Pmin and leave it as is, or do we want to um, make it more specific in the text that that we should actually have this um, this equality uh, only for this specific use case? Um, so, what do you think about that, Michael Coster here? I, I believe that um, it might be helpful to explain what the expected behavior is. Uh, mm. Explain it that way rather than as a use case. Because, you know, really what we're talking about is when the PMIN and PMAX are equal, which, by the way, I totally agree with, and my implementation uses that. <laughs> so, um, mm, okay. you know, it's, it definitely was kind of an oversight to not have it be allowed, uh, in my opinion. So I think if we explain the expected behavior, which is when Pmax and Pmin are equal, the notifications will be sent um, every every uh, Pmin equals Pmax time period. Then um, mm. I think that will cover it. And that way, when you read it, you get you get oh yeah, this is how I do it. This is what it's for. 
but it yeah. doesn't doesn't yeah it just sort of explains the expected behavior which i think yeah yeah so so as long as we constrain it to that behavior that if, if we want that behavior then then make well, it I don't, to okay I, is there any other behavior that would be reasonable here or aren't we actually trying to specify the well i, I understand we're not really specifying the behavior it's not going to be shall or anything right but mm -hmm. um probably I, I guess we could consider that but we are we are basically setting expectations for what happens and and there are a bunch of other cases in this draft where where mm -hmm. um we were asked to explain you know the uh the behavior for different corner cases and so i think this is definitely mm -hmm. one that that requires explanation and behavior okay um, of course, there's no guarantee that the client will be receiving no the notification every n seconds. Uh, this probably yeah. just um, suggests to the server. So I, I was going to to um, suggest that we say something about this because uh, uh, in in the previous behavior, you essentially could say uh, p min and p max are the tolerance bounds. Mm -hmm. And yeah. since th there is no way that you can uh, actually hit uh, the period exactly, uh, p min mm -hmm. and p max would tell you what what the tolerance is that that is acceptable. And mm -hmm. um, so the the uh, side that uh, needs to do the the updates uh, knows that it has it has to do it at least p max and and not more than p min. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we could set them to, to two values which are just a small epsilon apart, and th that would make it very hard uh, for the implementation to actually fulfill this. And uh, if we set them th the same, then it's uh, actually impossible uh, to fulfill this. Mm -hmm. um, so this means th there's actually an expectation of a tolerance that we then no longer can express. Um, so we, we lost something by allowing them to be set the same, but we, we already lost that by allowing them to be set very, very close to each other. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's uh, as an implementer, that's if they are set the same, I really don't know how how hard I need to try keeping those mm -hmm. those boundaries. You know, as, right. as an implementer, <laughs> I basically just use these parameters to set a state machine that has an, a timer and it does notifications on the best effort. And I think all, all along, uh, this notification system we're designing here has been best effort, right? even observe is best effort. So I, I see no problem in extending the idea of best effort to these parameters and not not representing it as a contract, but as a um, a sort of um, programming of a state machine that does the notification. And I've always seen it that way, and it, it always has worked out in implementations that way. I mean, so um, and I guess that's the way it's the way it's sort of implemented in lightweight M to M. Uh, implementations, the way it's implemented in the ARM embed server, the way it's implemented, partially implemented in OCF um, with the minimum set of parameters that it has. Um, so I, I just see no problem in stating that this isn't a contract that we're expected to fulfill um, bounds of and is seen as failure if you don't, but rather a best effort uh, state machine um, programming parameters. Okay, so um, in this case, do you think that uh, it will it will be useful to um, indicate this in the implementation considerations section um, as to how how they should be treated? So I could I could do that. I could, you know you could put it the implementation considerations that that um, we should see this as an implement um, as an implementation details as when. Um, yeah, I think I think that could be that could be good. I think that if you really need to hit periodic bounds, like in a process control system in a in a in an industrial field bus or something like that, you're going to be using TSN and you're going to be using some kind of uh, delay, you know, DLL kind of uh, thing on the nodes to do that. 
And <clears throat> that's not what this is for. And I think we could we could make that clear. Yep. Okay. Okay, thank you. So I'll I'll get get that done in the next version. Then uh, going on to the other changes. So this this has already been been uh, in in the in the pipeline for a long time, and and now it's in version twelve. So there are these two attributes, EP min and EP max, uh, which are uh, suggested which suggested by Ellen, um, and which talk about evaluation periods. Um, uh, at the server, so so this is um, this is something that is in the draft now, and also uh, while we were doing this, we had a small um, editorial change, and then we when we realized that that some of these attributes were conditional notifications, and some of them were control. So now there is um, in in draft twelve there is a separation between which attributes are conditional notification attributes. And which are conditional control attributes, and um, in the conditional control attributes, we left um, p min, p max, e p min, and e p max, and then in the uh, uh, conditional notification part, we we have the others. So um, this therefore also leads to the next slide. Uh, sorry, terminology question: uh, Is it intentional yes. to say measurements of the conditions instead of evaluation of the conditions again? I think this is something that Alan could um, could could clarify. Um, this text was suggested, and uh... hey guys, um, you know I'm I'm fine with evaluations. I've used both. Um, so the, uh, there's there's a separation of responsibilities when you actually go read a value versus when you can compare that value. And so to me, and this one, I was actually doing two measurements. So reading the sensor itself versus comparing the doing the evaluation of what was read. So in this case, I thought consecutive measurements was correct. Um, but uh, evaluations is probably better, I think. Well, uh, um, you could evaluate something without measuring it. I just read, <laughs> I just read this as measuring a condition that initially yeah. sounded uh, a bit strange, but maybe it's just uh, the way you express this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I, I suppose, I suppose when, you, when you're boiling it down to implementation, Alan, you're, you're basically talking about sampling. Correct. Correct. The actual actual uh, values. Yes. And that's that's why I use measurements. They're not evaluations. I'm trying to figure out whether I would have any objections to evaluations, but it's your sampling rate. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. We we could we could um, tune this a little bit better because this actually leads to the to the next point that I have in the next slide. But um, let's. Okay. Is there any other questions for that um, EP mini EP max before we move to the next one? Yeah, actually, yes. Then before moving to the before moving out of the EPMIN and EPMAX, um, to what is the status of EPMIN and EPMAX on level ten two and one dot one and one dot two? Is it already there? Uh, yeah, it is. It's already in um, the the specification. Okay, thank you. But I mean, more than anything, what what we're doing really aligns with with what's in the lightweight MM specs. And you know the purpose of these attributes. So it, we're, even though we may be wordsmithing, we're not changing the concept. At least. And, and, and Alan, maybe you, I'm not so familiar with OCF, but um, is this something also OCF might be using? No, OCF is not using no. this. Okay, okay. Well, they, they, they do implement just... um, conditional notification, but they didn't use the specification. However, the way they implement it with um, their PMIN and PMAX, uh, and I think they have a, a thing that works the same way as um, our, <laughs> I forget what it's called now. But anyway, they implement three of the parameters. They call them different things, but they're, they're pretty much implementing the same state machine. Okay. Uh, could I just clarify, um, um, Michael and Ellen, in, in the, the lightweight term specs, is, is this the exact wording for EPMIN and EPMAX? 
have have they have you uh... started with the exact wording the same wording okay. um I'd have to look to see whether that's been modified yeah. further. Uh, so the corollary to this is that are you are you still including EPMIN and EPMAX in your specifications, or are you just referring to this draft now? So far, we're we're defining EPMIN and EPMAX more in the lightweight M spec because there was no DIN link draft that had it. Mm -hmm. What I would be doing as soon as we are done with our call it stable draft. I would go back to the lightweight M, M specification in the next bug fix release and move out all the duplicated stuff because I hear yeah. duplication. Yeah, especially if the semantics start to differ, then that's a real problem. Yes, exactly. So I, I mean, my goal is to get it done in DINLINK, get a stable draft, then go fix lightweight M. &M. Okay. So the the idea here is that um, I guess to to try to resummarize. Maybe not needed, but um, is that this is a hint to the sampling system about what frequency you expect it to work at, even though it doesn't really affect the notification. In other words, you could look at the notification parameters and the type of sensor you have and make a decent judgment about the sample rate. But what you're trying to do is sort of provide a hint to the sensor to to change that, right? It, it, exactly. Think of it this way. Uh -huh. If I do a PMIN and PMAX, then to meet that PMIN and PMAX, the device can go to sleep uh, till PMIN expires, do a sample, go to sleep until PMAX expires, and then report. Of course. Of course. Well, that's what that's sort of what you do with the low-power sensor, and that's that's a different... So yeah, okay. Yeah, and that's, that's not good behavior for those devices that are... Um, you don't want to wait the 55 seconds between P min of five and P max of 60. So, um, okay. Um, basically this normally wouldn't really be part of the design, except that it's such a, 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 a common thing to do. And also this is the place to do it. I mean, it's like, it would definitely as sort of in, in band with the whole, uh, reporting and sampling system. So I, I kind of, I kind of would advocate for having this because I guess we've already decided to have it anyway, but it seems like it's, even though it's not a reporting parameter and you could conceivably do without it, it's something that in a lot of systems makes it a lot easier to implement this notification. And you know, Michael, it's interesting because when we started to go down this path, what we figured out is we, we really have two sets of parameters or attributes here. One doing with the actual evaluation of the measured value and then the the second was really the the control attributes of reporting or in this case both sampling and reporting so yeah it it kind of makes sense to have both dimensions i, I don't want to bring up but you could actually report multiple samples when you report so you could have a system that samples at one rate and reports at a lower rate but reports all of its samples and so um and that's really useful for like seismic and stuff like that so um Maybe that's outside the scope of what we want to limit, but that, that should probably be allowed also. Like, we don't really say what you report. And so if your system allows reporting timestamp sequences, you should be able to just do that. I think that's actually in the composite uh, observation with the CINML body, isn't it? And we are, isn't that already possible with what we have? I don't think it's prohibited. So I just wanted to, to bring that up as another case where you need to set this, these uh, sampling rate differently from the reporting rate. Any more comments on? Well, this then. Team? Oh, yes. Sorry. Last thing, just for the minute, for the for the minutes. I think I have the latest version of uh, Live at M2M. Uh, but if you, Alan, could be so kind to copy paste the section with the EP min and EP max is defined for the minutes, uh, that would be great. Just copy paste it in the in the the link in the chat. If you can, please. We'll we'll do. Let me pull that up while we continue talking. Perfect. Okay. Then, uh, if we move forward, um, the next the next page, the next slide. Sorry. Uh, so this is this is a 
what what is planned in the in the versions after of the version twelve. So um, there has been some discussions uh, previously about um, with with Klaus and some others who um, indicated that that the way the um, the the text is written now um, does not does not reflect a very restful way of of doing uh, doing um, notifications between a server and a client. So I'm making these editorial changes right now to to try to uh, reflect these notifications as restful state state changes and state transfer, uh, and trying to limit the uh, text where it says uh, sending new values and 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 so on and so forth. So trying to give a better impression that we are looking at, at restful state transfers instead of message passing with new values. But uh, that also means that I, I started to look at um, the current text in um, pmin, pmax, and, and, and step uh, about sampled values. And um, there's a lot of text there that, that says that, um, that um, the new values that, that are being transferred to the client will be sampled uh, from the server side. So I'm going to try to see if it's possible to restrict this uh, this text so that when we talk about sampling and 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 values uh, we try to limit that to epmin and epmax and then for pmin and pmax uh, it will be more about uh, checking states and transferring new states and uh, updating old states that's the most important changes that will be made. And then also there was a discussion about the possible impact of having uh, proxies between the client and the server and the behavior of these uh, conditional notification systems on, on uh, receiving the, the, the correct notifications to the client if there is uh, the proxies in between. I don't think we reached a consensus on how to proceed with that yet, but that is that is in the pipeline. And that was creating issues with Pmax, especially, if I remember correctly. Yes, right. yes, it was. Hmm. Okay, and a possible extreme way out could have been to just um, rule out or by hope and declaring, well, this was designed and supposed to be end to end only, so I'm sorry, but. It will be a last resort. <laughs> so it, it was designed to be hop, hop by hop, I think, instead of end to end. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because the proxy, um, it depends on the proxy policy. This could be made to work with a pub sub protocol proxy that, you know, um, but the caching proxy, the way we normally think of it in a RESTful system was, I think, the, the main issue with it, um, being able to just transparently cache things and there was some specific, um, I think I wanted to capture that. There was some very specific, you know, we talked through it and, and yeah, you couldn't just apply a regular caching proxy up and have a bit different policy if you want the notifications to come through. Um, but I, I don't remember the, I, you know, we don't have to walk through the specifics of it, but it, I think it had to do with both the proxy and the caching that um, that was the problem. Yeah, I think I think uh, Christian's suggestion at that point was was to um, consider the max age as a, as a uh, in place of Pmax. There was also uh, some concern that you know values might be sent that were not changing and how that affected things. But um, mm. whether you wanted to just keep the value the same or whether you wanted to actually send a notification of the unchanged value, and there was some confusion and head head scratching about. Um, what what that even meant? <laughs> I, again, these are not things that I see as problems the way I plan to use the system. But we also want to make sure that the behavior is well understood and that people understand how to use it in their system. Yes. Yeah. So so I think I think that's 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 something that will um, need some deeper discussion before it can be. Uh, Properly articulated in the in the in the draft. Yeah, there was a there was a new set of uh, behaviors proposed to to deal with that, but um, I think that definitely breaks the current implementation. So that's that's where we where that discussion sort of stopped. Mm. There is also an issue on GitHub about this point, right? Yes, there is. Yeah. 
Uh, I don't know if already for version 13 you'd like to, to sketch a possible um, way out building on the original Christian's approach. Uh, then it's easier to discuss on top of something written down. Uh, let me see what is written in the issues. I, can't remember now. I think that my, my issue that I took away from that discussion was that there were things that um, um, we, we, what we couldn't agree on <laughs> was whether to prohibit things that were allowed now. And I think there were, uh, I think we need to circle back with Christian and Klaus both to, mm -hmm. to find out specifically, maybe get point, put a tighter, sharper point on those. But um, I, I don't see a problem with adding things to provide mechanisms, but also we need to probably standardize what's already being done if, if we can. and and. I didn't really see any showstoppers. It was just that there was a better way to do it that did include caching proxies that had a different set of, um, had a kind of a different state machine and used different sent values were, sent values were critical to this. And we're trying to stay away from, you know, what, what actually gets sent and, and having the, the value be part of the, I don't, I don't know, the value is part of the state machine and that it gets evaluated by the limits, but that's that's all we wanted to do. And then there were some other things about uh, deltas or something like that. I don't remember the exact designs being proposed, but it was a different set of designs. And I think if we could, we could restart that discussion and figure out whether we could do it in an additive way that didn't prohibit some of the things that were currently being done. Specifically, I remember, um, Christian didn't like the idea that you could set the parameters by that were constant. He wanted to only allow parameters that were per request and per uh, session, if you will, the observe session. And I think that lightweight M2M and some other implementations do need to basically just, if you're looking at a point to point thing, um, especially like with MTM, it goes from a single sensor to the server. We don't even allow multiple connections. So, um, you know, in that sense, uh, it makes sense to just store them per, per resource. But I think we need to actually check that out also. Um, I'm going from memory here, but those were the objections that I remember. Yeah, I think, I think it's a good idea. Uh, was we I'll try to I, I think, back and, uh, schedule some time to. Yeah, I was proposing yeah. just to close that off. I was proposing that we allow three ways of setting the parameters, and two of them were per session, and one was being stored. But I don't remember the exact. And we didn't have to say that the way lightweight MTM works and storing them with a, a payload on a get or something like. No, I don't remember what it was. It was a put with an empty payload or something like that. But query parameters. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't have to specify that particular method, but we should be able to say that it's okay to store the parameters per resource. They, there could be a stored set of parameters that could be also uh, parameters per observed session. And I think that that's, that's what I was proposing. And then there are two different ways of setting it per session, one with query parameters and one some other way. I don't remember. But um, that's where I think that was left. And I think we, pardon me, need to circle back with Christian and find out, you know, just sort of propose that and say, is that okay? That, you know, again, it's an additive thing where I don't mm -hmm. think we need to be prohibiting things that the people are doing, but uh, we don't have to specify them either if we think they're anti patterns. So I think there's a happy medium in there. Yeah. Uh, Bill, could you elaborate on these alternatives for the ITF meeting and raise them there? Also, more people present, and then yes. already yeah, I think we could, yeah. is better than something else to consider. Just to avoid that the discussion resumes again in three months. And <laughs> well, I think I think it might be good to have at least an editor's note in the in the next draft that that yes. explains that we are we are um, still exploring this this area. So Great. that could be already done. Okay. So um, not very much uh, slides left. I think if we move to the next one, Marco. You have it. Um, so, thanks. Yeah. So there are there are three there are three uh, attributes, and and actually I also raised them at the last meeting. Um, I haven't received any any replies, but but since we have a slightly more targeted group here, it might be good to raise that again. So 
um, three new attributes were were proposed. Um, the first of these three is is the edge uh, query parameter, and this is also from the library end to end specs. So Michael Koster again, of course. Um... The the spec as it's written requires notification at any time one of the fixed limits is crossed, and I think that um, I think this is for the fixed limits and not for the moving limit. But um, maybe it applies to the moving limit in some sense also. But you were able to then track the band that the value. You know, we had this concept of there being like three bands: high, medium, low. If you have two limits and five bands if you have four limits, et cetera, because the basic algorithm is it's extensible to more than just two limits. It, it works scalable. Um, but you were able to track which band the, the sample samples last notification was in because you had notifications. Of course, this limits your ability to do that, but um, also it's not required. You can still have both edges. So it, it seems like right. we had this discussion in Lightweight MTM that uh, sometimes you really only need to know the positive crossing. You have some way of other, other way of figuring out the, how the state's been restored that you really just kind of know when to turn the alarm on or something like that. So there is definitely a use case for it. It's just okay. Yeah. All right. So, um... uh, Bill, very brief question. Bill, I'm checking the red book because I, I thought I saw the latest version, but. Um, there is no text proposed for this, is it? Or is it, it's only on the issue tracker, right? Because at least I cannot see it on the markdown in, I, in Ripple. So the way I did this uh, is I just, no, oh, sorry. I, mean, the, the, I, didn't, I didn't propose the changes in, I didn't create a pull request, I only created an issue, because the issue represents what's when, within lightweight M, lightweight M to M, but I didn't, it, I, I guess it, it wasn't really my goal to get it adopted into the DenLink draft. That was what I wanted to talk about, whether we saw value in the, the parameter or the attribute and whether we wanted to incorporate it into the DenLink draft. That's why I didn't create a pull request. So is this so, a okay. kind of thing? Um, I, I was just looking for, oh, sorry. Um, just very briefly, I was just looking for some text uh, where I can see the definition other than the live within to M1. That's why I, I was asking, because I couldn't find it on the actual uh, draft uh, or in the GitHub repo. So um, I, I actually had a question on this edge um, attribute because it specifies, the first thing it specifies is that it, it says the edge attribute indicates a transition of a Boolean resource. And then it goes on to talk about observed resource and uh, and so on. So, where, could you could you explain the significance of a boolean resource in that sense? That do you does it necessarily need to be either zero or one, or can it be, for example, just true or false? Does it have to be zero or one? I mean, zero or one representing the state. No, yeah, I, yeah. I think so it was just I think we. I'm, I'm actually looking in the lightweight m, &M spec trying to jog my memory on this. It, it was just trying to, to, to designate a, a state that's evaluated to true or a state that's evaluated to false, not the actual zero or one string. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I answered your question. Okay, so because, um, all right, I'm looking, I'm looking if, you, if you hit that link and go to the spec that I mentioned, it does indicate that the edge value is represented as the string of zero or the string of one, or I should say the, okay. the value of zero or the value of one. I think what we could clarify is whether this works only with a Boolean resource, in other words, a, a resource mm -hmm. that's only evaluated as true or false, or whether it works with the crossing, the crossing of fixed limits, because I, I remember it as being also include the crossing of fixed limits, but here it just says Boolean resource. So really you're saying, I want to notify whenever this resource goes from false to true. That's kind of what it says here, but I think the, the broader case might be implied also, so we should clarify that. Okay, and the, this is text I quoted from the lightweight M&M spec, so this is exactly what it is. 
in the lightweight MM spec, which is only about a Boolean. Right. Okay. So this is when you're observing a Boolean and the Boolean changes both directions. The, the existing spec says, you know, report both ways. And this says, <clears throat> if you want to know both transitions with edge, you could set up one for positive reporting one place and one for negative ones reporting someplace else if your system works that way and that might be a... I, I think it's a little bit different you would not define edge in that case because the default behavior is you track both uh transition states false to true and true to false that's the default right that's the behavior we already have this is if you already know that you only want to track one direction you can use this attribute If I, if I may, I mean, I'm somewhat familiar with Live with m 2 m <laughs> It's been a, I've been working on it for quite some time, but still I, I'm not 100% sure I understand the, uh, this new uh, query parameter. Um, shall I propose or suggest that um, the authors just uh, provide some text specific of, uh, of co-op if, if, uh, on how would it work rather than something too light within term centric could be just so simple, I because I guess you're not going to have this. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I, I was just going to say, I know where this, I believe this <clears> came <throat> from somebody whose main interest was in Laura and what they're trying to do is stop an extra message being sent for something they don't care about. I don't think we care about it quite as much in the, in a call it a normal deployment. But if this stops a, a an uplink message, which is very costly, to just to say that we went from true to false, even though we don't care about it, then that's what they're trying to prevent through this attribute. So I don't I don't really know how prevalent it's going to be. And if it's a lightweight MM explicit thing, that's fine. You know, I, I, I have no problem with supporting the fact that it's not a, a uh, a common use attribute, and if somebody wanted to find this for lightweight MM, they're more than welcome to. So we can ask for additional justification if we want, or we can just say it's rejected. So, but to to address what Jaime said, I don't think there's a way to <clears throat> specify this entirely in co-op because this is really a a resource value kind of thing, just like a numeric. So. If you look at the example code, we really are talking about three types here. We're talking about scalar types and string types and and Boolean types, which or we guess could be expanded to any kind of enum type or, or category type. But so what we're talking about with numeric types are all these things about greater than, less than and all that. But for strings, Boolean and any other category type, we're just talking about whether it changes or not. But for Boolean, for Boolean types, and the example code really has Boolean as a separate case, you can um, you can separate out these these uh, values. This is sort of like a special case of a value, but there are only two values. And this is, you know, it's not really greater than or less than, but you can say positive or negative. Um, so I think this is just a special case of value where this attribute only applies to values that, that have true, false, and we could, you know, there's one zero, true, false. Some, sometimes it's even text values that are true and false. And I don't, we'd have to define whether whether this edge would apply to whether you're sending like a mm. JSON text value, true and false. I would I would suggest that it could still. Um, but I think that's what this is for. So there's no way to really define it only in the co-app layer. This has to be just a general resource value where, you know, and if you can't say enough about your resource values to say whether they're scalar or string or, or um, you know, other kind of complex thing where you're only looking at changes, then you probably wouldn't be using uh, the conditional notification. I got lost a little bit in there. Are you referring to the value of the edge attribute or how no, the edge No, the value of the resource itself. It says right. Boolean so resource. Right. So mm -hmm. you have a resource in lightweight M to M. Resources can be like a, a scalar types. They can be string types. They can be Boolean types. Correct. Uh, so and yes. that's also true of just general sort of resources in general. Like if you're talking about, I, I'm not sure about Cbor, but JSON has true and false, and I think Cbor has a 
but probably a built-in Boolean type also. And that's really what we're talking about is when you're using that type, that's when this attribute applies. That's the way I understand it. And I think we should just clarify that in the text if, if we include it. I, I think it's useful. I, I see what you're saying because it's half as many messages on a LoRa system, it's half the cost. Well, um, let me let me see if I can understand this correctly. So let's say let's say a client sets this H attribute to um, to one. So so at, at the rising edge, which which basically means that when um, the resource moves from false to true, you send you send a notification. Um, so as time goes by, let's let's assume the 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 original state of the resource the, is 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 false and it, it it goes to true. So then the server sends one notification, right? Uh, and the the state will be set to true. Now, does that mean that okay, when when it moves back to false, you don't send anything, but then when it goes back to true, you send another true. So does this mean that the client will be continually getting uh, state observe, uh, observe states that are the same basically as, as as true and true and true all the time so this is what the behavior is proposing i believe the answer is yes well <clears throat> my answer would be that, that this is uh, just a request to the server to spend more more of uh, a best effort in notifying one edge than then notifying the other edge, but it doesn't mean that the server is prohibited from notifying the other edge. It just means that that uh, it should try really really hard to notify the one edge. Okay. Well, it doesn't have to try at all in the other on the other edge. Is really what we're saying. Yeah, I I, I guess I would agree that it, we we wouldn't prohibit it from sending extra notifications, I guess, but if you were building a system that was conscious of, you know, energy and, and resource use, it wouldn't do that very often. Okay. So do we have a consensus on whether this should go into the draft? I'm not sure that that spending no effort would be consistent with eventual consistency. Um, but yeah, sure. So you can spend infinitely low effort. <laughs> okay, that's asymptotically so, approaching. So the mathematician in us, that's close enough. <laughs> okay. We could capture that you spend half as much effort as you did the last time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's let's move to the next one. Uh, we are running out of time, I guess, today. So. No, it's okay. Okay. until five thirty. But. Uh, ah. Okay. Okay. Excellent. All no. Right. No rush. <laughs> okay. And um, then there is uh, the, the the next attribute is um, also. Uh, it's about whether the um, notification should be sent over a confirmable transport. Um, so this is uh, this is this text obviously is extremely lively and term specific since it, it talks about objects and instances and resource and resource instances. Uh, At the so, same time, though, every everyone has this idea of a fire and forget versus something that's uh, acknowledged. So I, I think it could be a general hint in that direction, right? I'm happy with this attribute as long as you don't call it quality of service. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here's what's what's interesting um, is there's no we have, we now have two types of we have control attributes and we have uh, notification attributes. Is this a control attribute? Because now it's actually a, a third kind of representation, which is you know how you construct the message, right? Is that? Hmm. Should, do we? Do I, I, I think I think this influences server behavior. So um, I, I probably would think of it as a control attribute. I would like to create a third class I, of I attributes would, now. 
and then populate it. No, eventually. I'm good with that. I just, I, this is kind of, I think this is a valuable attribute because it does describe the server behavior in terms of constructing and sending the message. Oh yeah, I would echo that in my in my experience using this uh, this conditional notification in some practical applications like sending light dimmer setting values to a light and things like that. Um, sometimes con works better, sometimes it works worse. And so you definitely need to set it. And what I had to do in my implementation was go and change some defaults in some C header files, and I would rather not have done that. So I would plus one this as a control attribute, a control hint also. Um, All right. Uh, in other words, if you require uh, confirmations, you're limited on the rate that you can yeah. send messages and sometimes. Um, I think I think we probably need need uh, a little bit more clarification on what a confirmable transport is as well. So that 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 needs to be kind of clarified. Yeah. So expecting an acknowledgement. Yeah, I was gonna I, I was gonna ask exactly that. Mm -hmm. The the reason we did it um, is essentially. If, if it's a, a fire and forget, so it's sent non-confirmable, you tear down the radio connection as soon as you send this. You're done. You sent it, I'm done. Tear down the radio connection with whatever you know, uh, time to live you may have for that. But the, if it's confirmable, you have to leave the connection up waiting for that confirmation. And so you're, you're actually using up more radio resources if you send it confirmable. And it also implies a certain priority or a certain criticality of the, the observation. If it's sent non-confirmable, you send it, you drop your radio, it's lost, you're like, hey, you know, I can live with that. But if this is an alarm, a, in other words, my building's on fire, you don't want that to be sent non-confirmable. You want it to be acknowledged from the, the, uh, the, the client side and you have different behavior based upon that alarm versus another alarm. So the, the use of it is I think important the verbiage we we need to make it more generic agreed and get rid of maybe not even confirmable transport maybe just sent confirmable um, but we'd need to wordsmith it. Mm -hmm. I, I yeah, really I, think I, it has I, to do I with think also, uh, just a second, Michael. Uh, I would also like if you could um, build just or uh, the authors. For all of these new attributes, just make sure that all the live attend to jargon is, if possible, removed and generalized to co op endpoints and to avoid the usual confusion between resources in live attend to m and resources in the co op sense, the client server roles, et cetera, because that will be important. And this clarification that Alan just made, I think it could be useful for the reader too. It doesn't have to be long, but like to, to explain what's the point of that attribute and how it changes the behavior. Uh, yep, that's all. I'd, I'd suggest we look at even not being co-op specific, but just being generic and saying whether you expect acknowledge, acknowledgements to these notifications <clears throat> or not, because that's really what you're doing with con and there are other places you might want to use observe outside co-op protocols where you could map it to some other kind of behavior. I, I guess we could use co-op con as an example. But but not not in a normative way. I'd suggest. Yeah, I think I think this this is the point. Um, um, I'm I'm trying to think of of whether this this draft maps maps into the rest paradigm or is it co-op specific? And I think a lot of the um, parts of the the draft is is not necessarily only for co-op. So when we talk about confirmable transport, there are two parts. With are we talking about non and con? Or are we talking about transport in a sense that it's um, UDP versus TCP, for example? Yeah, it's interesting. So we're not talking about reliable transports. I now understand the, the the comments from earlier. I was thinking co-op specific <laughs> because I always map things to co-op. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is more about acknowledgement, and acknowledgement at co-op is confirmable. So if acknowledgement is provided through some other layer, then mm. you wouldn't need a, a an acknowledged transport. Mm. You'd need an acknowledged message. So in your system, you could decide to map this to TCP if it uses con. Right. That would be a, a viable option. We're not. We don't need to specify. Okay. So we should make this text more generic to say that 
and acknowledgements should uh, or must be sent uh, for this resource. Okay, so um, Marco, can we move to the next yeah. uh, slide? Uh, I, I I really don't want to read this uh, through for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> really right, can't. Just, just, uh, this is the last. Right. I'm so sorry. I I, I left I left the, the 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 worst for the last one. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna give you a real quick one on this one. Just five yeah. seconds. It's a it's a cute. It's a stack size. If you're offline. So if you're offline and you're doing observations, how many do you keep? And so this is a control attribute also, basically. Correct, correct. And this kind of also goes back to what Michael said earlier, that if I do have a stack of 10, I, you know, what is the specification, specified behavior if I, when I do get back online that I need to offload these 10? Do I just create a block of 10? Do I create 10 individual ones? Is that non-specified? Um, so that's, it's it's literally this is your queue size. Okay. Any comments on this attribute? Well, this is a little bit hard to translate into a more general case because uh, what exactly does it mean for a client to be offline? Um, so, so if if the notification is happening in non-conformable messages, I have no idea what this means. If it happens in conformables, well, yeah, then then maybe the server could take note if if those don't succeed and keep something. Yeah, this this is definitely violating some layers <laughs> or trying to incorporate. Um, let's say a device state with the ability to report. So if the device knows that it doesn't have a connection, um, then it can't, it knows that it can't even send a non-confirmable message, right? So it does violate, I don't know if I want to say violate, it, it, it includes an evaluation of a communication state to be uh, realistic. Maybe it wouldn't need to, though, because maybe what we could say is that you're... So one thing is, it seems like you're probably ignoring Pmax or, or something like that. So never mind Pmax. But what you could say is simply that you're allowed to send multiple notifications, and this is how many are the maximum that you're expecting. That's really what you're saying here. In other words, you don't really have to talk about online, offline. You can just say when you notify. Yeah, you know. But, the, it, but if you have an a priori knowledge that you cannot notify, do you throw it into the queue, or do you only throw it into the queue if it's confirmable? Because you assume if it's not confirmable, it's fire and forget, which then you don't really care whether there's a, a, a current con link. All you care about is I know it can't get there, so I'm going to forget it. Well, it could be a app. It could be a system policy whether to queue, and you could queue all the messages. And when your queue gets full, you could start throwing away oh. non non <laughs> non act one ones that don't require <laughs> acts. I mean, you know, how much do we have to couple all the behavior of the different parameters? Is my question. I don't want to get talk about it too long. I I. I... I'm glad we were able to introduce it. I don't think we're going to work through all the logic on the next, oh, uh, on this call, because I actually have to drop. Sorry about that. But I, I think it's an important concept that if, if the observation is not, I don't know if, yeah, I, I think you guys know the questions. It's really along the line of, you know, if, do you actually create a queue? if you know that message is not getting through? And how deep is it? Yeah, it's do I queue messages instead of notifying as they happen? And this is how many can I queue? And so I could see a lot of different ways, reasons for doing that besides even just being offline. Um, anyway, let's, let's, 
I'll, I'll try to find the issue and weigh in on it on GitHub. Thanks, guys. A good conversation for me. Sorry. Thank I'm you. Up early. Thank you Alan. Okay. So the, the, so, the other okay. problem I have with this text is that it kind of presumes that after a connectivity gap, when you get back your connectivity, uh, you replay all the changes that have happened mm -hmm. in the meantime, and that's not how Observe works. Yes, yes, that's, that was my concern here also. Um, and, and, and that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm not so um, in favor of this uh, going into the draft, but I'm open for suggestions if I, if I find that um, somebody has valid reasons for doing this. Yeah, I think um, it would I, be no, better, I'm sorry. Go ahead. It would be better if we had a way to actually officially keep history in some form. Hmm. Would that okay, be my side behavior then? Right, we could enable it as application behavior and also not if it wasn't tied to co-op. So in co-op, you do have a question about observe and what the meaning of the values you get on observe is. But if it's not co-op, if it's just being used in general, I think just allowing the idea of queuing them and, and maybe it's an application layer question. I mean, I can write a co-op notification handler that handles multiple values, it's just not it's not specified. I don't know if it's even prohibited. I guess we make a lot of assumptions again about caching and proxies and things like that, that this might might also be, uh, you know, sort of run across crossways up. But I, I still think that it's if what people are doing is allowing the buffering of multiple measurements in a single notification. I think that's that's an issue in and of itself, you know, how does that break co app or whatever. Uh, but that's really what's being done here. And I, again, I think that there are other cases where you might want to do it, like even if you just had Pmax reporting and wanted to report samples within that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a valid use case, but I think we do have to answer what, what does that mean in terms of what we expect from uh, co-op system. Yeah, and, and um, I, I can't understand how this might work, for example, if um, assuming this behavior, if, if um, if a server comes back up online and there are notifications in the queue to be sent and there is a PM in value. And then you have to send these messages from the queue at the same time as um, state changes that might be occurring uh, while it is off or while it is online. So well, you could do this. If there were timestamp, you wouldn't really have an issue with that. I think this is basically to support a functionality like logging and things like that, where you want to store some things and not lose them and then just send them later as data. Um, right. But but you want to be able to to specify some size to minimize network consumption, right? right? And even just to prevent DDoS attacks, you might want to have this kind of parameter in your system if you allow this batch batch notification. But that's kind of what this is for. So uh, yeah, you wouldn't be handling it as oh, I got six now, I got one. What what's the order? You know, you wouldn't be handling it that way. You would only be handling well, it. But, but this is this is anyway historic data. This is not this is not fresh data. This is well, historic. It is. Data. it is. But um, so again, co-op observe has does this doesn't really this isn't what we expect from co-op observe. But it maybe it's a different kind of notification where you're not trying to treat it as state changes on a single value. And so that's that's really what we need to reconcile. I think we do we add this que uh, queuing and batch notification behavior at all. But we're I, going to prohibit I, it, or I don't know whether we should be overloading observe with these things. Uh, well, so this is what you would do, and this is done in a lot of systems today. If you want to have co-op as part of the system that has this, we need to figure out what the best practice would be for implementing it. Because to do efficient log notifications and efficient uh, transmission of this kind of data, this is kind of what's done. I, whether it's part of our protocol or not, I guess we can still decide. Mm. Uh, Carlos, can I this just one? Well, we are trying to talk at the same time. We might have to start moderating uh, maybe a bit, uh, but let me just jump in with some clarification for the notes and also for myself. So to my understanding, Dean Link actually was still intended for co-op endpoints because we are mentioning multiple times in the discussion 
that it might be for other kind of endpoints. And, and it's great if we can generalize, but it should support RFC 7252. And similarly, it was intended for observe, so it shouldn't break observe. I guess that's a, one of the requirements as well. What, what do the authors think about that? Can I uh, say something? If that's okay. So um, when I came on board as the editor, I think I think it was more than just um, corp. So there is the observe attributes. There is one part of that. But then again, um, later in the draft, there is uh, the the concept of link bindings. And in the link bindings, it um, I mean the, the draft is oriented towards uh, mostly supporting coop, but there there are other REST methods that it has to support. And and as, especially later on. When we talk about link bindings, it, it talks about um, REST, REST methods that may not actually support uh, observe. So I, I have a, I have my, my, my personal opinion is that, that it's, it's not quite specific. Okay, I mean, then maybe the, then the intro of the draft also should be revised if that's the case. Um, I have to look at and see, but I actually assume that the intro did say that it doesn't. Uh, I, I think that the, when another point with the draft like this, just speaking as one of the draft authors, is that we're providing a pattern that, you know, is, is, is um, will work on co-op for sure. But also we recognize that this is a higher level application pattern that's sort of like the way we align PubSub with other PubSub systems and stuff like that. So having it to be useful in a system that, so I, I guess what I'm saying is we shouldn't really build things in a way that restrict systems to only have co-op end to end and that we, we probably wanna be able to do some communication and proxy and, and have co-op to be part of mm -hmm. other systems. And so in designing this in a way that everyone can use, it just, it's just useful to design a, a general pattern. But of course, yeah, you know, so the question of does it break observe? Well, if I can I use observe just to notify? Uh, I can use co-op as a protocol just to notify data without having uh, any any particular, you know, I can send one and then I can send true and then I can send a string and, you know, I, I can really do that. And nothing is preventing me from, from changing the type of data that I send because co-op doesn't really restrict that. So I don't know what's what's what do we want to prohibit? I think is the question, and I I kind of go toward being a little more open. And this is optional, and if you can implement it in your system, um, so if someone uses co-app to create a spec like OCF, they get to decide whether it's part of their spec or not. If I just implement co-app as a contractor on somebody's industrial control system, I might decide to use this on my my SCADA because it's efficient and it doesn't. I don't really care. It's just end to end. And, but I'm still using co-app because all my endpoints already support it, and I don't want to just switch to Modbus just for this. You know, um, I don't know. Enough said, I guess. <laughs> Uh, I have a question for Karsten before. I wonder if something like this can be achieved not with observe, but with the non-traditional responses that you proposed some time ago. Yes, so um, maybe just the, the serious transfer pattern. Uh, um, I, I think we, we have this gap here um, that, that Michael has identified, uh, but we shouldn't try to paste over this gap in an ad hoc fashion. Uh, for every case where, where it comes up, but we should address the gap. Okay, so um, what I will do is then this this uh, discussion on HQ Max, we could take it to, to the to GitHub or to the mailing list. Yes, sounds good. Okay, and um, that that is the last um, um, part of Dying Link that I wanted to uh, share with you. So, I guess now we are uh, we are open for more questions, uh, and if not, we can close. That is the Dying Link discussion. 
Yeah, is there any I more have one more one more comment to make that I wanted to make earlier? Um, and that is that this this may be a case where we close off the additions to this draft and we have follow on drafts that describe additional parameters. And, and it's sort of easy to break it up that way. And maybe we should think about although we do have a minimum set of things they want from lightweight MTM, but also we need, we could think about uh, closing off the draft with the stuff that we all agree on and know, and then figuring out. But I guess there's something to be said for, like, as Carson said, if we decide to switch to using series transfer pattern for a lot of these things, then that might be a different, you know, another question of a separate draft. So um, I think that's still an option of saying, let's keep this draft simple and add the additional material in the additional draft. Any more input? So thanks, Bill. That was a good discussion indeed. And we can expect a version 13 with something merged from the editor's copy already uh, understood and some more points addressed from the issues. Then something more will stay open, but alternatives to consider can be raised at the ITF meeting. Yes, I think I think this this is this is fair. Um, today's discussion was very valuable to me. So, so draft thirteen will include um, some of these attributes, but not all of them. And then uh, the changes, the editorial changes, will go ahead. Very good. Okay. Uh, anything more you wanted to discuss today on this or other things in core? I also just wanted to point out that it was a really good discussion. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, then I think we can close the meeting. Uh, we have one more interim in two weeks before uh, ITF 110. Uh, till then, enjoy the rest of the day or evening. That's so my, uh, my recurring question is uh, SID documents. Oh, uh, hi, Michael. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that was actually discussed before. Um... Read your telegram. Okay, great. Thank <laughs> you. I, I, I missed the beginning of the meeting. Thank you. Actually, it was before the meeting started, but uh, yes. Yeah. So if you have an uh, opinion on the idea, uh, you could say it now. I don't understand the split, but um, I'll take it to the list. It just means that we will do uh, Yang Sibo and Sid now and uh, uh, progress these uh, while we are still finishing Komai and Yang Library. Okay, that I didn't know that there was a plan to do otherwise, but that makes sense to me since the first ones are referenced by the second group, right? Yes. Not the other way around. Yes. So you still have to complete some split write-ups anyway, Carsten, right? Before. Certainly. And that, that, I mean, I have most of the write-ups for the first two done. So uh, that's done quickly. So I hope I can do this today. OK. Great. Thanks also for this last minute update. Uh, then I think we can close the meeting and talk to you in two weeks. <laughs> Have a good one. Ciao. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.